All right, everybody's in from the waiting room. All right, well, welcome to our spotlight talk today. I'm Larissa Huff. I am the communications and program specialist at the Wharton Ashrick Museum. Um, and I wanna thank you for joining us for our fun 20 minute lunchtime chat. Um, and Sophie's gonna teach us so much new stuff. It's gonna be very mm -hmm. exciting. Uh, if you could keep yourself on mute uh, for the length of the talk, that would be awesome. And then at the end, we'll have some time for questions. So you can unmute or put it in the chat and I can read it out loud for you. Um, and because we've only got 20 minutes, we might as well dive right in. So, so we can max out our time. So I'll hand it over to you, Sophie. Thank you, Larissa. Uh, so hello everyone. I'm Sophie Glenn. I'm the operations manager here. And today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, the inspiration behind building the studio. Um, and it's kind of an interesting topic because we usually start off a lot of our experiencing Eshrick tours about how the studio was built. And uh, it's built, it was built over a 40 year period if you're not already familiar. Um, and we kind of go into little bits and pieces about the, the inspirations behind parts of the studio, but we never really get to uh, have some images associated with that. So I kind of took this as an opportunity to do that. Um, so I will go ahead and share my screen here. Bear with me for one second. All right, so building the studio. So as I said, it was built over a 40 year period from 1926 to 1966. And it was, uh, we usually talk about this at the beginning of our experience uh, experiencing Eshrick tours here. Um, but again, we don't necessarily get to have images associated with those different inspirations or um, unless you go into our visitor center bathroom and see the cabinet of Dr. Caligari little poster that's in there, you really don't get a lot of uh, visual context for what we're talking about. Um, so I kind of took this opportunity to do that here and talk about those inspirations a little bit more in depth. Uh, so without further ado, I'll just go ahead and start from the stone portion of the house, which was the first part built in 1926. And it was built because at that time, Wharton was, or sorry, Eshrick was getting into more furniture making and uh, working with wood, uh, which is a much larger medium than the painting he was doing before. Uh, so he really needed a studio, a separate studio space where he could sort of expand his practice in that way. So that's why this uh, stone portion of the house was built here. Um, it's very much in the Pennsylvania barn vernacular that would have been uh, local at the time. So it's a stone building um, and the windows here in the front uh, probably normally would have had barn doors there, but there were windows placed there instead. Um, and there's also a little bit of an arts and crafts inspiration in there as well. We'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, however, the two main influences behind uh, the, the uh, stone portion of the house here were the philosophies of both Frank Lloyd Wright and uh, Rudolf Steiner. Uh, so starting with Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, we all know Falling Water or maybe are familiar with Falling Water, which is probably one of his, arguably one of his most uh, well-known structures. Uh, it's located outside of Pittsburgh. And um, he was all about uh, organic architecture, which is a term that he coined uh, pretty early on, I think as early as 1908. Um, and essentially it is sort of an offshoot of the Lewis Sullivan term, form follows function, ex except form and function are one, according to Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, so the idea was that architecture should sort of work with and um, sort of uh, match stylistically with the surrounding environment and look like it's kind of the architecture should look like it's uh, somewhat emanating from the surrounding environment. Uh, so you can see here it's named Falling Water because the waterfall is actually coming through the property here. Uh, so it's supposed to work with some kind of level of cohesion to it. Um, Estrick himself was not really a big fan of the architecture itself. He was more inspired by the philosophies that Frank Lloyd Wright had put together. Um, and I believe he was actually uh, quoted as saying that Frank Lloyd Wright should take a page from his own book and his own writings in regards to the architecture. Uh, so stylistically, he kind of deviated from that quite a bit. Um, and then getting into Rudolf Steiner a little bit, who uh, was not only an architect, but a writer and sort of this esotericist, um, sort of just kind of this uh, very interesting figure uh, and actually was the founder of Waldorf education. So that gives you a little bit of context there. Um, but his main ar architectural achievement is the, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but Gertinate, Gert Gertanum, um, which was actually two structures. Uh, the first one was built in 1919. It was made uh, mostly out of wood, but eventually burned down uh, shortly after it was built. So then a secondary one was built in, uh, I believe, or completed in 1928, and it was made completely out of cast concrete. Um, so the image that I have here on the right is actually some postcards that Eshrick had received. 
um, that depicts the Goetheanum. Um, and he was very heavily inspired by his architectural philosophies. Um, and with that, it was all about essentially just having this architecture be somewhat like a sculpture or you're like you're walking through a sculpture. Uh, so much more dealing with organic lines. Um, I'll get some more images here. So this is actually the front of the structure here. Uh, you can see it's all cast concrete uh, and we're dealing with a lot more organic lines and a little bit of symmetry here, but a little bit deviated from that when we get into the, uh, just an image of the interior space here. Uh, and working and sort of his general philosophy about life and humanity itself was that we're, our bodies are just essentially vessels for the spirit and we sort of, uh, our spirits progress through the interactions we have with everyday life and through our education and through artistic practices. Um, so it's a little bit over my head, um, a little bit, so I try to generalize it as best as I can. Um, but essentially in this structure, uh, it's, it gets its name from Goethe, who was a German writer, philosopher, a uh, bit of a biologist, and had extensive knowledge of uh, color theory as well. Um, so a lot of this is inspired by, or what is what inspired um, Steiner to create this structure. Uh, talking a little bit about the interior of the space, uh, the pink walls here, and the painting style are known as leisure painting, uh, which was a method of essentially layering paint colors together. So it, can almost, it almost seems like the colors are transcending one another and you're walking through like a cloud structure almost. Um, so like the spirit can sort of pass through these walls on a spiritual level. Um, so some of that may have been ins an inspiration to Eschrick himself, especially when we're talking about the silo and sort of the paint um, coloring there. Um, but you can also see that the interior staircase here and the railings are a lot more organic than um, Frank Lloyd Wright would have done. Frank Lloyd Wright was much more uh, geometric, um, where these have a lot more uh, organic elements to them and much more sculptural elements to them. That was probably an initial draw for Eschrick. Um, and with that too, I also want to talk a little bit about the arts and crafts movement, um, particularly in, in regards to Rose Valley. Uh, so the arts and crafts movement was uh, roughly between 1880 and 1920s thereabouts, so at the turn of the century. And it was really a, a movement that was pretty antithetical to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, so at that time, machines were kind of taking over and taking over a lot of the manual labor um, and sort of the craftsman qualities of a lot of things being made during that time. And a lot of people did not like that, sort of took away from uh, a lot of these elements that were a part of handmade furniture and other, and other uh, crafts. Um, so the arts and crafts movement was really just an answer to that. And Rose Valley in particular was actually a bit of a social experiment um, brought together by um, William Lightfoot Price. And uh, with the arts, so the community was, uh, became a single tax community that was based on the philosophies of the arts and crafts movement. So with that, they had Rose Valley shops, which an advertisement you can see here. And I like to bring this up too, because a lot of, not only the architecture inside the build, you know, the uh, stone portion of the building, but a lot of the furniture was sort of inspired by the arts and crafts movement as well. Uh, so I have an example of that here. Um, so this is sort of a trestle style table and the trestle is referring to uh, this piece underneath. Um, we have some really prominent joinery here, which is really showing off that handmade quality. Um, we have some, it's predominantly red oak, which would have been a very local, uh, locally sourced wood and the arts and crafts movement was very heavily based on locally sourcing a lot of the materials. Uh, ornamentation like this carving here was sort of abandoned in the latter half of that movement, but was very prominent in um, the early stages of the arts and crafts movement. Um, and it's usually visually heavy pieces of furniture as well. Um, so you can most see that in the uh, 1927 cabinet desk that's in the museum currently. Um, and just to give you an idea of the interior of the space, if you hadn't visited in person. Uh, so a prominent feature in a lot of, uh, we call them craftsman homes now, are uh, exposed beams. And these beams are actually a resource from a soon to be demolished water wheel um, in the area. So, and they were salvaged from that and they, the, the size of them actually dictated the space a bit and the stone was acquired from a local quarry. Um, so really relying on locally sourced materials here as well. All right, so moving forward to the wooden edition, which was added in 1940. Um, prior to that, it was uh, Letty and Eshrick had, Letty, his wife, and Eshrick had separated, 
Uh, so they decide to move to the Rose Valley area to the Hedgerow Theater specifically, and Peter was going to live with uh, Eshrick at that point. So the wooden addition is really sufficing as both a live and workspace. Uh, so Peter's bedroom is up top in this wooden addition here, and then there's a more flushed out dining area and kitchen right below that. Um, and then what was formerly the attic space above the studio became Eshrick's more formal bedroom at that point as well. Uh, the main inspiration here is German Expressionism, uh, which is also a uh, main inspiration behind the garage, which was built in 1928. Uh, so just to give you a few examples of some German Expressionist work being made uh, around that time, uh, we have Kandinsky here on the left, a uh, picture with an archer. And then we have Emil Nolde, the prophet, uh, woodblock print on the right here. Uh, so German Expressionism and most Expressionism in general was uh, pretty much a response to Impressionism wherein it was more about expressing uh, one's inner feelings as opposed to uh, rendering things realistically. Um, so we're getting a lot more experimentation with use of color and uh, kind of more flattened out um, perspectives here, particularly in this Kandinsky uh, painting on the left. Um, and there's essentially two schools of thought with, or two main artistic groups associated with German Expressionism. And I'm gonna say it in English because I'll butcher it in German. Uh, but the Blue Rider was one, and the bridge was the other. So there were two um, kind of artistic groups. Kandinsky was part of the uh, former. Um, and the Blue Rider specifically, uh, the horse is actually a very prominent feature in a lot of German Expressionist art, particularly in the Blue Rider um, school. And it became kind of a symbol of moving forward with artistic e expression and changing of um, uh, changing of ideas, really, and the bridge sort of also um, symbolizes that as well. Um, but just to give you an idea of what the artwork was looking like at that time, these are two pretty prominent uh, pieces. Uh, moving along, uh, the main inspiration was actually a um, horror film made in 1920 named The, Ca the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Uh, so I, I have some stills here from the film, and you're welcome to watch the film on YouTube. Um, I believe you can watch the entire thing on there. I believe it's like 45 minutes to an hour somewhere in there. Um, but the set designs are really unique here. Uh, so we're dealing with a lot, oops, excuse me, <laughs> dealing with a lot of kind of severe angles and kind of scary looking architecture. I mean, it is a horror film, so that sort of makes sense. But also like the windows here are painted on and like these sort of more dynamic um, angles and sharp lines are also painted on the floor to give a little bit more dynamism. Um, and this was a really early draw for uh, Eshrick and creation of both the garage space and the wooden addition of the house. Um, you can see this also in some of the set designs he created for the Hedgerow Theater. So this was the stage sets for When We, Were, when we Did Awaken, um, made in 1930. And you can see the set designs here are uh, relatively small, but sort of emulate those weird severe angles, um, prismatic forms and things like that. Um, so that was a very early draw for him. And just a side-by-side -side comparison. So uh, another still from the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, um, and then a side-by-side -side of the wooden addition of the house. And um, there is the stone portion right underneath here, but it does kind of look like it's floating with that sort of bare background right behind it. Um, so it sort of gives you an uneasy feeling. Um, and the lines all kind of taper upward. Um, and, and it's sort of same similar thing happening here. Just for a little added bonus, we do have a letter um, to Theodore Dreiser written by Eschrick, uh, detailing sort of the, uh, the wooden edition itself. Um, Dreiser was a great author and a friend of Eschrick's and was really a big inspiration in actually getting the studio built initially. Uh, so he would have this great correspondence with Dreiser over the course of the building of this house and the studio. Um, so here we see Peter's room is a tower higher than my bedroom. You, you would like it. Um, and just nice little sketches of uh, old and new here. And then just of the side profile of the, of the property. And finally, we have the silo, which was the final piece built in 1966. And I'm kind of going to lump in the uh, deck here, which is built a year prior in 1965. Uh, but here we actually see a bit of a return to that um, barn vernacular, which was an initial um, inspiration for the stone portion of the house. Um, we have a silo, obviously, so that's a pretty prominent feature in a lot of barn architecture. Um, but with that, too, we actually have these columns down below, which were also inspired by barn vernacular. Um, so here we can see that it's actually holding up the deck space. And then if we see this image of a um, 
I believe 18, 17th or 18th century barn here um, in Chester County, we see that these columns are actually uh, hold, supporting the overshoots of this wooden barn here. Um, and uh, eventually the sides of these columns were worn away by cows that would use them as scratching posts. It's a bit of nature sculpture there, which is a sweet little story. Um, but a particular interest and one that we talk about uh, a lot uh, over the course of the tour is the paint, um, paint job here. Uh, so the silo itself is made out of concrete block and brick, um, and then it has a stuccoed outside. Um, and the pigment is actually mixed into the stucco. So he's actually kind of going, reverting back to maybe some of his earlier paintings here as well. Uh, the paint is supposed to be reflective of the fall foliage, at least that's what we understand. Um, and at that point, he wasn't actively a part of the um, painting process because he would have been in his late seventies at that point. Oops. Um, but he would instruct the painters to add more yellow here and more red there, for example. So he was very much um, dictating how this was supposed to look. Um, and just to give you an idea of some of his paintings, uh, we have uh, two oil paintings that he created in the 20s, a farmhouse on the left and New Hampshire house on the right. And this kind of gives you a bit of an idea of his painting style at that time. Um, so he was trained as, a, as an impressionist painter. Uh, so with that, the painting style included um, a, a layering, a paint layering technique where you would uh, essentially have one color here and another color here. And if you to look at it far away enough, they'd actually visually blend into the color that they were going for. Um, so here you can kind of, in, in the New Hampshire house in particular, you can kind of see the uh, similar colors to the silo on this little walkway here and these mixtures of green in here as well. Um, so I imagine that was a pretty um, prominent inspiration for building of the silo as well. Again, reverting back. So it's kind of doing like a full circle kind of thing. Started out with this Pennsylvania barn vernacular architecture um, and integrating other bits of inspiration in between there, and then kind of reverting back um, into that um, barn vernacular again. Um, and if you think about it, the, the studio is really kind of his largest sculpture. Um, and it's one that he lived with and made changes to and made additions to. Um, and it became sort of this living sculpture in a lot more ways. Um, so with that, that's all I got. Um, so I think I kind of breezed right through that, but wanted to end on this uh, nice little angle uh, of the studio. You can see all the parts all together. Um, yeah. Stop my sharing now. We can open it up to questions if we're, if we're ready. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Rob Leonard here. Uh, yep. Just another note on the uh, original studio building. Uh, Bob Baskin mentioned to me that um, one of the nods to uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was that Eshwood didn't build the barn on top of the hill. He built it into the hill, lower mm -hmm. down on the hill. Yeah. Yeah, and the, I didn't mention this earlier either, but the stone portion actually tapers upwards. So it's supposed to mimic the roots of a tree. So also kind of mm -hmm. well, yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Any other questions? Quiet group today. <laughs> Just quiet. <laughs> you were very thorough. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I had I prepared like I wanted to make sure I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> I tried to be as thorough as I could in 20 minutes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. If there's no more questions, then we will wrap it down. Um, okay. I will send a follow up email with some links relevant to some of the things that Sophie talked about. Um, and as we continue to celebrate our 50th year as a museum, uh, we are shifting from our home as site uh, into home as self section of the year. So we're going to be opening our juried exhibition on June 2nd with a big fun virtual opening reception on June 3rd. Um, so if you look on our website, you can register and come. It's at 6 p.m. on a Friday. So bring a glass of wine, we'll hear about the artists, we'll see some work, uh, it'll be very exciting to usher in the next chapter of the 50th anniversary year. Um, and other than that, I think that's all we've got for you today. So thank you for giving us your lunch hour um, and joining us and we will see you at the next event. Yeah, thank, thank you. you, bravo. Thank, thank you. you.